Good morning. What a wonderful time of worship and sharing and praying together. Uh, it's really great. Welcome to our Canadian friends back. And uh, glad to see you, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Holly. Welcome back. I'm going to continue on into John. Last time I was up here, I had just taken us through John 17, which was what I de defined as Christ's priestly prayer. And now we want to move into John 18. Father, thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to stand here as an earthen vessel and to just share and open the scriptures. So I ask that you would anoint this time. It's very special, and we hold it as special. Father, the coming together here in the name of Christ, singing and, and lifting our hearts up and our thoughts toward you, and sharing those things where you have been active in our life and touching us, and then praying for those of our loved ones and friends and family and each other. And Father, we come here now and ask that you would continue to be here with us and among us and speak to us. Open our ears that we might hear. Let our hearts and our souls be receptive to you, God, and you along this morning. Quiet our hearts from the cares and concerns of this world and anything outside of these doors. God, let us be in content and intent on hearing from you this morning. So I pray for that anointing from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet as an earthen vessel. For God, I'm just a man, but glad to say redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And I ask that you would anoint the time here as we open your, your word and look into it, that you would strengthen and encourage and root down every individual in this room in the person of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I commit this to your care. Amen. So here we go into John 18. We come now to considering the closing hours of our blessed Lord's life here upon this earth. All through the time of this one evening, we've been traveling in this one evening through John 13, John 14, 15, 16, 17. And here we are at chapter 18. I have always been just amazed <laughs> how John just put the brakes on here and slowed down. This was such... Now, you have to remember, it just wasn't his will in writing these things, for all Scripture is inspired by God and given to us by that God breathing and directing into the lives of the writers of Scripture. And I believe that. I stand on that to this day. This gospel is ordained and anointed as well as the other books in the Bible. But John put the brakes on when it came to this last week and then to these last hours of Christ. He's committed so many chapters. And that's through the inspiration and the guiding and the leading of the Holy Spirit for a reason and a purpose. Some of the most eloquent and impactful teachings of Christ to his disciples were in the upper room. Remember when he washed their feet? 
and told them, so must you. You know, Peter said, oh, no, Lord, you got to worse. You can't worse just my feet. And Jesus reminded him that you are clean, Peter. And if I can't do this for you, I can't do anything for you if I can't serve you. So many teachings Christ gave us. Some of the ones that we just hang on to all of our life. John 14, where Jesus looked at them and said, I and the Father will come and make our home in your heart. We will live within you. And remember, this is just an evening. Amidst all the other things going on in their lives, we have such a microscope of this time with Jesus that they shared. So Jesus had been looking forward to the hour when he was to give himself a ransom for our sins on the cross. And now he had enjoyed a time of close and holy fellowship with the men he had called out of the world to be his companions those men that we call the disciples. And you recall back in the upper room, he excused one of them. They didn't get it. That guy got it. He knew why he was excused. I don't think the rest of them really understood why Judas left the meal right then. Some of them might have even been wondering, am I going to be the one that Jesus said would betray him? But now here he had had this fellowship with them and he had them with him nearing the end of the journey that he was on going to the altar of Calvary. And they'd just been with him as he lifted his heart to the Father in intercessory prayer. And now he walked over this brook, Kidron, that you heard about in the reading that we had here this morning. Here in Matthew 18.1, when Jesus had spoken these words, the words of 13, chapter 13, 14, 15, 16... And the prayer of 17. He went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron. He went out of Jerusalem, is what that means. He left the city, went down into the village of Kidron, and there was a brook there, oftentimes dry. Of course, in any rainy weather, it was flowing and full. And they crossed it. There could have been a bridge there. I think there is a bridge there for tourists today. I've never been there. I've just only read about things and heard testimonies of friends who have visited. So they went across this river and this, this brook, and excuse me for not getting into a lot of detail on its history. And it's mentioned several times in the Old Testament. But I would just like to remind us of one. David, King David, is recorded as having crossed this very same brook after being exiled from his throne by the rebellion of his own family and friends. King David, God's anointed in exile across the same brook. And here is the one who was promised from the house of David, the Lamb of God, the Son, the Messiah, crossing that same brook on his way to Calvary. Here Jesus would have walked up the slopes 
of the Mount of Olives to a garden. And there are many gardens located on that mount. And this one, the writers of the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew and Mark, named it Gethsemane. We're so familiar with that word, and we're so familiar with that phrase in the garden where Jesus went. It's even kind of alluded to having been a walled-in space because it said they went in to this garden. Might have had a brick, uh, rock wall around it. But it's also a place that we saw in the Scripture reading here that he and his disciples... That there was a garden which he and his disciples entered, and Judas, who betrayed him, also knew that place. In all of the synoptic gospels, we are told that it was a place of familiarity with Christ, where he would go with his disciples. So this wasn't his first time to go there. But let me just tell you this. It wasn't a place of hiding. If he wanted to hide, he would not have gone to some place so familiar to his traitor. But he didn't. In fact, he went to a place where he surmised that was so familiar with him going to maybe in the evening and after a meal that the traitor would come to find him there. (laughs) So here he was in this place called Gethsemane. It's said by some to mean an oil press. And where the olives were thrown into a press so that the rich golden oil of the olive oil would be extracted and expelled from them. A crushing place. And it was here that our blessed Lord, the Son of God, was to go through the oil press of life, as it were. The awful pressure that was to be put upon his heart and mind in view of the coming sacrifice that he was about to offer on Calvary. Now, I've got to tell you, this is the third rendition of this message this week. I had one where we're going to get through chapter 18 really quick. (laughs) And then at 4 o'clock, or yesterday afternoon, I felt the Lord leading me, and I completely redid that. Oh, slow down, Bob. (laughs) Don't go flying through this. So I thought, I'll just major on Peter's issue there. And then at four this morning, God woke me up. Hello, Bob. Why don't you get up out of bed? I've got something I'd like to talk to you about. And I said, but Lord, I'd rather lay down. So I got up, and then I laid back down, and my eyes were like this. I couldn't, could not go back to sleep, which is unusual for me. So I got up and went into the, my little study area, and God began to show me that he wanted me to even slow down a little more. <laughs> and so I think it's really important that we take a look at what's happening here as we go into this chapter 18. It's so Every chapter we've been at in John has been so rich and full and fun. But now he's going into this last evening, late evening, of his walk here with the disciples. And he was entering into the oil press where the awful pressure was now going to be put upon him and his heart and his mind in view of his knowledge of the coming sacrifice that he was about to offer, which he was fully aware of on Calvary. 
The time of the power of darkness had come. The time had come. Throughout the Gospels, remember at the wedding in Canaan where he first did his first miracle and his mother was imploring him to take action, to not to save embarrassment there for the fact that they ran out of wine. And he told her, woman, my time has not come. But in his compassion and mercy and gentleness and kindness, he saved the day, and we know that. The miracle at the wedding of Cana, where he turned the water into wine. But that wasn't his hour. That was just the beginning. That was actually recorded as his first miracle. And in Luke twenty two thirty five, 35, in the Synoptic Gospel of Luke, and the Synoptics, I think I've explained that, and you know that, that's the ones that kind of blend together. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And then John, he kind of <laughs> went off on a different trail. None of them have these many chapters dedicated to the last night of Jesus' life. No, you'll find their records embedded in a chapter and maybe not a whole chapter. <laughs> but in Luke twenty two fifty three, 53, Luke wrote that when Jesus, and later he will be at this point where we're seeing him now, but later he's going to be in front of the high priest, the chief priest. And Jesus stands there in front of them and says, when I was with you daily in the temple, you did not try to seize me. But this is your hour. And the power of darkness. Jesus knew what hour this was. It was their hour, and it was the hour of the power of darkness but you know it's really interesting it was his hour the light of the world <laughs> the very essence of life remember he said I am the way the truth and the life the very giver of life and this was his hour this was now everything was coming to place in God's timing and plan. This just wasn't an event in the life of Christ. This is an event in the creation of life itself. From the foundations of the world, God knew that he would send a redeemer, his son, God had promised it, and now he had fulfilled it, and here he was. The three synoptic writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all tell us at this point, and I think it's remiss to just go right into John 18 and miss what they brought to light, too. They tell us at this point of the great agony that Jesus went through in the garden. And Luke records for us, and he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw. They went into the garden, and actually we are told in the Synoptic Gospels that he invited John and Peter and James to go with him. And he left the other eight at the gate. And the fact that it was defined as a gate in the garden, which also tells us it must have been walled in, and an enclosure, probably really beautiful. And he brought them in, and then he withdrew from them 
from the three about a stone's throw. And he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Oh, those are famous words. We have heard them from our youth if we've grown up in a Christian home. And if we didn't grow up in a Christian home like me, I've heard them since I became a Christian. Because they're words of truth where Christ wrestled in this beginning of in this moment of his being pressed. Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And then it's recorded in Luke 22. An angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Now, later we'll read about Peter and his experience here, but we're told it was a cold night and that the guards had even made a fire to warm themselves. So I don't suppose that Jesus was sweating because of the heat of the night. He was sweating because he was being pressed. <laughs> that he was in that olive press of life in this garden and praying, knowing in full knowledge of who he was. And as a man bearing the weight of what was coming. I don't know about you, but I am really glad I don't know what's coming tonight or tomorrow. <laughs> I probably wouldn't sweat blood. My heart would just probably stop. <coughs> stop pumping blood. Most of us would be in great fear if we knew what Jesus knew. But thankful to him, we don't know that. And Luke tells us how under that great pressure, the blood burst from the pores of his forehead and fell in great drops to the ground. And how an angel came and strengthened him. It's interesting what can happen at four or five in the morning. My notes I put down and an angle came. <laughs> and I read that angle, no, angel. Let's get that correct. English words, right? We don't have a word of this from John, of this event. It's not in the Gospel of John. Why not? <laughs> How could he miss? He was one of the three that was invited into the inner sanctuary there with Peter to step in and go further and pray. Why didn't he record it? Well, it says Jesus went forward a little further and fell on his face and endured that anguish of the soul, and yet John does not even say a word about this. Why? I would like to suggest this. Here we can see the perfection of the Holy Scriptures. Why is John the only one that has chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and now 18, talking about the same evening hours? Why John? Why is it so important, John? I mean, 
that's a lot of scripture that you've dedicated to this evening. But not the others. The synoptic writers did not give that much time to it. And then we get to this one point of his anguish, of his sweating blood, of his crying out to the Father. And John, you know, he just dismisses it. I think it has to do with the, how the scriptures are divinely given accounts of the Lord's life and death and resurrection. And each one of the gospels presents a special viewpoint ordained by God and, and led by the Holy Spirit. And God breathed. It's been noticed, and I've stated this before, the subject of Matthew is Christ the King of the Jews. And the object of Mark is to present him as the servant of God, doing the will of the Father at all times, lacking in nothing. And then Luke presents him in all of the perfection of his manhood. You have to remember, he was the perfect man without sin. Praise God. There was no one other who has ever walked without sin that could stand up and say, I'll take their place, Lord. I'll do that. Because God demanded a sacrifice. He demanded that perfect lamb without blemish. But John's special object in the gospel of John is presenting his eternal sonship, his deity. John brings him before us as the divine one. And so in this gospel, there is no scene of agony in the garden, for it was not the deity of Christ that was concerned here. (laughs) Interesting, neither is no account of the transfiguration. Wow, what a glorious moment that was. Do you recall that in the gospels? When Jesus took... Again, Peter, James, and John, and went up on that mount, that hill. And all of a sudden, he was transfigured, and his glory was revealed to a certain extent. And they saw Moses and Elijah with him, and they fell down and worshiped him, and they wanted to build an altar there. Recall that? The transfiguration, a huge event in the Gospels. Well, John didn't record that either. And he was there. He witnessed that just like he witnessed this night in the garden. In John's Gospel, Jesus Christ, his glory shines all the way through. Just not a special event like the transfiguration or the garden. His glory is all through the gospel because John is revealing the deity of Christ to us, that he is God. He even starts it out that way. You remember that? In the beginning was the word the logos, the expression. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things that were created were created in and through Him, and nothing has ever been created that wasn't created through Him. And He was the light of men. 
and in his in him was life that's how john starts out in his chapter 1 so here we have the agony we find in john being admitted it's not that it's not important so that's why I want to bring it up this morning. It is a very important event. But don't forget that we have already been seeing that he is the Messiah. Remember what Peter said? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. But it's well for us to remember what the Synoptic Gospels tell us here. So what was really involved in this prayer of his, oh, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. What was this mystic cup? What do you suppose? Do you think he took a cup from the uh, upper room and took it with him? You know how we sometimes drag our cup of coffee with us? Or our thermos. Do you suppose he had his hot drink with him from the upper room or maybe some extra wine that he had shared? No, I don't think it was a physical cup. This misty cup which Jesus spoke of. And as we turn back to the Old Testament, we find some very solemn references to the cup of judgment. And we must remember... When we think back of the Old Testament, that was their Bible. That was it. You know? Look at this. This was missing because they were living it. They were writing it. The New Testament. The testimony of the New Covenant that Jesus spoke of in the upper room when he instituted the Lord's Supper. This is the cup of the new covenant. But the Old Testament was their Bible. It's what they had of God's revelation of himself to man apart from the man, <laughs> Jesus Christ, the perfect man, who the Bible tells us was the express image and representation of God himself. So what was this mystic cup? In Psalms 11.6, we read this. Upon the wicked, he will rain coals, fire and brimstone, and a burning wind shall be the portion of their cup. In Psalm 75, 8, we read these solemn words, for in the hand of the Lord there is a cup, and the wine is red. It is fully mixed, and he pours it out. Surely its dregs shall all the wicked of the earth drain and drink down. In these passages, we read of a cup filled with wrath. The indignation of God against sin. And when we come to the very last book in the New Testament, in the New Covenant, in the book of Revelation, we read of those who worship the beast and his image in Revelations 14, 9 through 10. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup. Full strength. And to the cup of his 
indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Wow. So what is this cup that Jesus is saying? If it can be, let it pass from me. It's a cup that's full of the wrath of God against sin. From the beginning of sin. Recall that? What are we having for dinner tonight? Apple pie. Eve said to Adam. He said, great. Let's have some. Well, we don't know there's an apple, but it's one we like to call the fruit of the tree of life. So we're safe in saying that cup of wrath that our Lord saw before him bowed him down and broke him down and he prayed Father if it would be possible let this cup pass for me here's what's interesting either you or I had to drink it we were destined to have to drink from that cup of God's wrath. For the wages of sin is death. Don't be mistaken. Death is not annihilation. Death is a physical, a spiritual effect on the man of God. On every man, not even of God, a man of God, but of every man. A spiritual separation. Isaiah said, it is your iniquities which have created this gap and this separation between you and your God. And you will drink. Isaiah didn't say this just like this, but here we know that you will drink of the cup of wrath because of sin in your life. Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. So either you or I had to drink that cup, or he must take it from us and drink it himself. Hallelujah. And that cup involved his being made sin upon the cross. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. It involved God the Father dealing with him as though he were guilty of all the sin, all the wickedness, all the corruption that men and women have been guilty of all down through the millenniums. Think about it. The horrors of the world now are upon him. All our sins were to be laid upon him and he was to bear in his own body and his own spirit there upon the cross to come all that these sins deserved. This was the cup from which he shrank. He, would, he drew back from it. But he could not have been absolutely holy one if he did not dread the drinking of this awful cup. Because the absolute holy one was God come in the form of man. God incarnate, flesh, breathing, hearing, seeing, feeling, compassionate, thirsting, hungry, crying, and laughing joyfully. Transcendent, almighty God with us. 
Of course he drew back. Knowing that this full wages of sin and this wrath in this cup that he was about to partake, this mystic cup, is more than any man could bear. And so the three synoptics tell us how he agonized. How his body was so racked with pain as he faced this time that his sweat fell to the ground as great drops of blood. Where could he turn? Oh, history is full of the stories of men and women who have come face to face with the realization of their sin. I hope you have. I hope you haven't been so protected in your life that you think, well, I'm a pretty good guy, you know. I haven't really been as bad as a lot of people I know <laughs> or read about or hear about. And what you've got to remember that all of the sin of all mankind is going out into this cup and full. And he's got the drink of it. That's a bitter cup. Now, it's really important to understand here that we don't get misplaced. He wasn't bearing sin here in Gethsemane in the garden. That's not what he was doing. He was not made sin right here. We might say he saw the handwriting on the wall. He knew what that cup was. He knew what was destined for him. His hour had come, and the hour of the power of darkness was there because the darkness thought, now we'll destroy him. And here underlying this horrible, horrible event where the enemy thought, he had his foot on the aorta of the Son of God. God had a plan to defeat death, to pay for sin. As Paul wrote, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. All this was before Christ. He was anticipating this and looking forward to it. Only on the cross did he settle the question. It was not settled here in the garden. He still had to go to Calvary. He still had to die and to bleed as a sacrificial lamb on the altar. Only on the cross did he settle that. And so we hear him say at last, this is really great. Here at last, Jesus says, Father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, your will be done. What a great lesson here for all of us. How do we deal with the enemy when he thinks he's got us impaled and it's the end? And if you haven't been there, I don't want to prophesy falsely on you, but you will be there because that's the enemy's plan for you. And James gives us a great idea on how to handle this. Christ shows us how to handle it. Father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, then your will be done. What can man do to me? <laughs> your will be done, Father. 
The sovereignty of God is on the throne here this night in the hour of darkness. God is on his throne and hasn't moved his power an inch. He hasn't moved at all. His plan says the foundations of the earth is being fulfilled. James said, submit therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee. Almost everyone I've ever met is well practiced in resisting but horrible at submitting. And what did Christ do here? He didn't resist. He submitted. And let me tell you, as an application here, when you feel that you're at the end of the road and at the end of your rope, that there's nowhere to turn, that you've been caught, that your sin is going to find you out, and there's no hope. Submit, therefore, to God. And by that, resisting the devil. And guess what? He has no playground there. He has no room there. He can't even stand there. You submit, therefore, to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. He will leave. The key is not resisting. The key is submitting, <laughs> as Jesus submitted. So we see here in closing, the entire scene of his agony comes in between. And we know so much more is going to happen, don't we? We know so much more is yet to come. But the entire scene of his agony comes between verses 1 and 2 here in chapter 18. When Jesus had spoken these words, when he had finished teaching them and being with them and disclosing his heart to them and making them promises, He went away with his disciples across the ravine of the Kidron. And there was a garden which he had entered with his disciples. And now Judas, who was betraying him, also knew of the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. And in closing, and the agony followed immediately. Father, we come to you and thank you for these words in the Gospel of John that shows us that the Christ, the Messiah, your Son, took his disciples into this garden and let them witness his agony. But yet... John has already told us and shown us he is the Christ. He is God. He is one with the Father and the Holy Spirit and the triune God is alive and in the garden. And Father, he submitted to the plan and he submitted to your will. And we know that, as the epistles show us, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising its shame. Father, might we too be a people and knowing fully well that the sin should be upon us and we should be the ones drinking from the cup, but God... Your mercy and your grace has delivered us from that. And Christ took that cup and drank it full on our behalf. 
Father, might we be quick and fast to submit to you in every area of our lives. Might we lay aside our goals, our agendas, our ideas, and our plans and not be afraid. For you are sovereign and you have the plans that you have laid for us that are wonderful. And the works that you've foreordained for us to walk in, you have created us for. God, might we be surrendered and submitted completely to you as our Lord and Savior was to the very end. And might the victory be won right there in our submission. Lord, the physical pain and suffering that Christ went through after this was significant, but the battle was won in his submission. And we give you the glory and the honor and the praise for this and this example and just not only example, but for this fact that he did this for us. And might we be worthy of Christ, not in our goodness and our works, but in our submission, in our surrendering, in our being willing to lay down our lives, to die to ourselves, that Christ might live in us the hope of glory. In Jesus' name, amen.